broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona. It's time for Valley Business Radio, spotlighting the Valley's best businesses and the people who lead them. Hello and welcome to Valley Business Radio, where we tell stories that traditional media tends to ignore and help connect you to the right people. I'm your host, Dr. Adrian McIntyre, and I'm joined in the studio today by Tish Times, CEO of Tish Times Networking and Sales Training. Welcome, Tish. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. And Lisa Riley, owner of Link Business and a member of the team for Market Pulse. Welcome, Lisa. Well, thank you. Happy to be here, too. Now, Lisa, this is a return visit for you, and I'm looking forward to hearing an update. You've got some data on small business mergers and acquisitions, sales, et cetera, that we're going to talk about. And this is, I understand, fresh off the press. It's not been released yet. It has not. We are actually, it's preliminary. We are analyzing it as we speak. (laughs) (laughs) As we talk right here in the studio, Lisa will be analyzing the data and we'll hear about that in just a few minutes. But Tish, I'd love to start with you. Give us an introduction to Tish Times Networking and Sales Training. You do sales coaching, you do training. How are you serving folks and what's unique about your business? Well, I help people to develop processes. And that's the thing that generally is missing. (laughs) We love to go and talk to people or we go to networking events and make great connections. But most people don't know what to do after that. So I help them to ensure that they have a process in place to not drop the ball to not ruin the relationship by taking too long to follow up, and then putting some things in place to make sure that they're able to maximize their profit um, while developing great relationships. And this is the most important part while still being themselves. I don't give them scripts and things where they sound like robots. They actually get to be themselves, yet make a whole lot more money. I think this is so fascinating and so important because, look, I am not a salesperson. I'm an anthropologist. And Lisa and I both have social science degrees and former university lives, but I'm a charismatic, outgoing person. Unlike some folks that struggle with what to do at the event, I'm in my element. Yeah. I'm really going to have fun and hang out and get to know folks and ask interesting questions because I'm curious. That's what I love to do. Yeah. I am terrible at everything you just described. <laughs> The follow-up, the not making people feel ignored, the, you know, the, the, the process. I don't know if I'm just allergic to process or if that's a story that I tell myself that doesn't serve me, but you must have both folks, both types, and then maybe there's more than two, in, in, your, in your world, people who really struggle with how to communicate in person. Right. And that's not my problem. <laughs> and then how to actually turn those conversations into cash. Absolutely. How do you do it? Well, number one, like you said, there I tend to attract a certain type of person probably about 70% of the time. Those people who really like you, they they are at they're networking rock stars. They're always out and about. You see them in all the Facebook pictures, right? But then when you ask them, well, how are you, you know, capitalizing on that, um, all that activity? And they're like, uh, mm, I've met some great people, but they have a they have a lot of great friends, but not a lot of great profit. So um generally I teach them how to have routines that develop into cash. And then with the other type, which is more like myself, you know, that that person who maybe has an extroverted um, appearance, but is an introvert by nature, teaching them how to communicate in the room and then to follow up with some processes that they may not already have in place. So it's easier than you would think to help someone to pick up where they're they're dropping the ball. But I definitely see both types of people. The, the other thing I love about this is that people are so important. I think there's a, a an illusion or, or and maybe some consultants perpetuate this myth that the right script is going to close the sale every time. And of course, everybody who's tried that knows that's not true. Right. That the, the trust that gets built is a human phenomenon. It's not a function of the words. And so you really need to develop the human being that's inviting someone to make a purchase. But as much as anything, sales training is really human training, how to be a better person yeah. so you can run a better business. What are your yeah. thoughts about that? Well, I have this saying, and, and you know, it's kind of cutesy, but I think it's very true. People will often say things like, you know, you need to get out of your shell and I'm going to teach you how to use the right words and say the right things. Whereas I tell people, I'm going to teach you how to rock your shell how to be yourself while still, you know, feeling authentic, not feeling like you're using my words. Because if you're using my words, when I'm not there, guess what happens? 
uh, you don't know what to say. Whereas if I help you to take your own personality traits and just show you how to be authentically yourself while still having the skills necessary to close sales, then you can do it anytime, any place, and it doesn't feel like you need to go take a shower after you have a conversation with someone because you know you were slimy, you know you weren't real, and people can pick up on it. I say that, you know, inauthenticity has a scent and people can detect it a mile away and they're never going to trust you if they don't believe that you mean what you're saying when you're talking to them. I, I think there's a really profound insight in this that people need to make peace with, which is that the reason why we all have such a good BS detector built in is because we recognize it in ourselves. ourselves. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, without going too far down the, the neuroscience rabbit hole, we have mirror neurons in our brains that are that are essentially mirroring the action of what we're observing. So we know BS when we see it because it's familiar. Yes. And so you can't trick, uh, you can't really trick people Right. No matter how hard you try. Or if you do, it certainly doesn't last for very short-lived. long. It's very short-lived. short-lived. Yeah. Now, sales in and itself is often viewed through a short-term lens. Right. It's about immediate results. It's, you know, whether in a in direct response world, you're tracking click-through rates and conversions online, or in a real B2B person-to-person type environment, you're looking at the outcome of these conversations in the short term. You're not looking at... What's the impact of this conversation in a year, 18 months, two years? You look to brand for that, sales, you're looking short term. And at the same time, that short term mentality can really mess things up yes. if it causes people to behave uh, in a, in with any whiff of desperation or urgency or lack of care yeah. for the other person's temporality. Right. But how do you address this? So I teach something that I call generational sales processes. And what that means is I'm looking for creating a relationship that goes beyond, you know, that first conversation. Um, and for me, I've been in business for almost 10 years And some of the same people who started with me at the beginning of my business, I still have as clients. And I I have that because it always has been a long game for me. And so, yes, you might need to have immediate conversion, right? You do want to have that um, income coming in sooner rather than later. But by the same token, if you have a transactional approach, that's what you're going to get. You're only going to have transactional sales. Whereas if you have a generational approach, not only you're going to have those long lasting relationships, but I want the type of business where if I'm in real estate, when my kids grow up and start buying houses, mom's going, hey, this is our person. This is who we do business with because they have such a great relationship. And so if we think about things differently, it may take a little bit longer at the front end, but it's going to be much, much longer of a relationship and you're not going to have to deal with that constant rat race where you're always trying to figure out where your next sale is coming from. When it comes to the sales process, every business is somewhat different. They have unique products and services and unique methods for engaging with prospects. But there are some things we can abstract out and call the process a process that applies across many different businesses. What would you say is the most important part of that process? Well, for me, I know that um, my specialty is in follow-up. And I think that for the most part, there are some people, like you said, that are very charismatic, able to develop um, great relationships, but they just don't have a follow-up process. And so what tends to happen is you have these great interactions and then you see someone like two months later at an event and you're hiding from them because you know you didn't follow up. And so putting the things in place, things as simple as having a great CRM. Things as simple as having a um, what I call a launch sequence where it's like from the moment I meet someone, it's like, okay, um, within 24 hours, I need to have done a within 48 hours. I need to have done B within two weeks. I need to have done C, you know, so there's some very specific things that need to happen along that process so that you don't find yourself consistently dropping the ball, always wondering why people are going with your competitors and they're never actually closing the cell. It's because the process is lacking and follow up is the one thing that the average person is missing in their overall sales process. So aside from somebody like me who uh, feels allergic to some <laughs> some of these things, rightly or wrongly, I mean, right. perfectly willing to look at the fact that this is probably, you know, some strange idea I got as a child. This is how we get our identity anyway. Something happens, we decide something about ourselves, and then we're stuck with that <laughs> interpretation as if it's the truth. I know that. It doesn't mean I'm <laughs> immune to it. <laughs> um, so for somebody like me or, or really for anyone else uh, who 
who prefers, rightly or wrongly, the kind of spontaneity and, you know, seat of the pants type thing. How do you help us get uh, at least a minimum viable mm-hmm. system yeah. in place? Um, obviously, to we don't become um, our opposite overnight right. or, or ever. Yeah. But you're trying to build some structures around the unique and creative expression of every individual. Right. So how do you, when someone comes to you, maybe they attend a workshop or they see one of your online uh, live videos or anything of that nature, and then they engage you in a conversation, what's your sales process look like? How do you get to the point where you're actually hired by them to begin helping them? You've got a sales process of your own. Uh, Absolutely. Um, Some of the things that that we do, we teach, but we also do in our business. It's a word that many people have heard. Very few people really understand. It's called automation. So there's some things that if that's not in your character to, you know, to do some of the things I'm talking about, you can create some of the automation where those things happen without you having to pick up the phone yourself necessarily. And then to back that up for that person who's not still not good at automation, we actually step in and do it. So we have a done for you service. So you meet someone at an event, then you hand the cards to me. And then my team makes those phone calls and gets them on your calendar and all of those things that are maybe you're uncomfortable with and don't necessarily know how to do. But we we take them through our process, just like we teach our process. So we're going to um, connect with you within the first 24 hours. If we have not connected with you within the first 24 hours, we're going to make sure we reach back out to you in 48 hours. We haven't had a sit down with you within a week. You know what I mean? So we're going to go through that same process. But we're also going to put some things in place within your system so that you don't have to think about it. You can do what you're really good at, which might be just getting on the phone and having a great conversation to close the cell. But if you don't get those initial conversations started, you'll never get to that that seat. One of the things that's so fascinating about the contemporary business landscape is the incredible diversity powered in a way by technology of the different ways we can connect, we can close, and we can deliver a variety of products and services well beyond um, those that were traditionally bound in place and space. You know, you had to go to the store to select the thing. Then they invented catalogs in the 1880s, right? And large department stores started arranging delivery of items to rural areas that did not have access to those things. We're now in a completely different world because, you know, the 8 million pound gorilla in the room is Amazon, which has come to eat everybody's lunch. Yes. (laughs) And still and yet, um, there are small businesses every day who are creating relationships with customers, fulfilling orders and delivering them through such a multiplicity of channels, whether they do it in a brick and mortar business or through Shopify or through Amazon as a reseller or any other number of things, consulting, professional services, et cetera. How do you make sure that your sales coaching is dialed into an individual business owner's uh, set of processes and products? there's, There's some things that are unique and some things that are the same. How do you make that determination? So, I mean, I just had a conversation with someone just yesterday who does something very different than the average client that I work with. And so I will normally have a conversation. I'm not going to just take business for the sake of taking business first and foremost, and I don't recommend people do that. So there are some businesses that we feel we're better qualified to work with than others. So one of the first things that we do is go and have a deep dive conversation with them understand what processes they're currently using, what things we might be able to complement and what things we believe are going to work or things that they are doing now maybe they should not be doing. So we're, our, our first consultation is going to tell us whether or not this is a type of business that we could truly help. Or I, you know, like others, I have people that I could refer business to that might be better suited for a high retail company or a company that does, you know, manufacturing and things that I don't currently deal with. So that first consultation is so important for me because I have learned, you know, desperation gets you into a quandary of issues. If you feel like you have to take business just to get money, you're going to disappoint people and you're going to tarnish your reputation. So that's the first thing we do is to Determine if it's a business that our processes are going to help make better or is it just going to create more of a, uh, you know, an issue. Um, and then we'll refer that business out if for some reason we don't feel like we're going to be the best help for them. Mike Michalowicz has a wonderful discussion. Oh, he's so yes. smart, so interesting. And 
um, in, in Profit First, and he's and I can't remember the name of this particular framework, but it's it's a way of describing the fact that in order to deal with a business challenge and generate more revenue, you can go in any number of different directions, and many of those directions will ultimately be leading you the wrong way, right? Away from your core value proposition. And uh, unfortunately, sorry, Mike Motorbike, I can't remember what <laughs> what the um, uh, name of this chart is, but get profit first if you I have it. I love it. I have it. Yes. You have it, right? Yes. Uh, and as consultants and professional service firms, we are probably more um, susceptible yes. to this than, than somebody with a brick and mortar business and a physical product because we like to, you know, um, lie to ourselves about our incredible adaptability and our we can solve any problem. This is certainly something I struggled with in the early years of my self-employment when I was doing mostly freelancing and stuff related directly to marketing and online uh, technology, you know, you know, creating sales funnels and, and websites and webinars and all of the things. Right. Um, this is uh, five, seven years ago, eight years ago. And I, I didn't do my due diligence. Yeah. I didn't talk to clients thoroughly enough to find out, look, we may be able to shiny front end on this, but there's holes in the back of the building right. that, that are going to actually be make vulnerabilities for the entire project that we're going to take on together. And I just didn't know yeah. to look at that. As I say, I never learned anything except the hard way. Well, I did too. You know, I literally found this out by doing it the wrong way. And then it, it occurred to me at some point, I had this day long, you know, business retreat for ourselves. I brought in consultants for my own business to kind of look at, okay, where do we need to be focusing our time? And on my door to this day, when I close my door in my office and I'm doing my sales training and I'm, you know, I can see my wall or my core values. And that for me is the, the literally the, the meter, the stick that I can always say, does it align with who I want to help? Does it align with who I said I am? Does it align with how we can best serve our community? And if it does not align with those core values, the answer is a good, easy no. And there used to be that kind of, but... But if I do this and I can make so much money and I, you know, and now it's like, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And I've been down the road enough to know. And I see many people who do it. Once again, desperation will get you into trouble every single time. And if you are not clear on who you serve, who is going to get the best value from you, what you bring to the table, you're going to say yes to things you ought to be saying no to, and it will destroy your business over time. So core values for me are huge. Not to mention your life, your yeah. relationships, yes. your health. Yes. This is the voice of experience <laughs> <Right>? talking. Um, <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many bad decisions I made that started with, well, you know, just this once. Right. It's not going to take me very long. Yeah. And, and you know, the money's good. This will be done in a month. 18 months later, the relationship is still struggling and both sides are frustrated. Uh, there's a lot of sales trainers out there. There's a lot of philosophies and approaches, some of the, whom we've had here in the studio to talk about their unique spin and their unique method and things of that nature. Tish, what are some of the unique things that you have done to set yourself apart from others who might use similar sounding words might seem that as a at a at a technical or superficial level they do the same thing. What's different about Tish Times networking and sales training? Well, the the biggest thing I believe, and I've said in lots and lots of sales classes, so I've seen a variety of different approaches. Number one, we are very big on authenticity. We're very big on helping those people who don't see themselves as salespeople to still be super successful in the work that they do. Um, second, you know, the other thing is the things that we know are not in the wheelhouse of those with whom we're, we're dealing with, we show them how we can assist them. Like I said, we have now done for you services. Um, very few organizations are going to do the follow-up for you so that you can focus on your core strength, your genius zone. So we step in and help those organizations to look like rock stars in front of their ideal clients because we're handling that back end for them. The most important thing I believe is I will never tell someone this is who you need to be to be successful. Instead, we teach them, you be you. These are the things that we're going to help you so that you shine. I've often thought it's a bit of a paradox that sales trainers are in the business of training. Yes. And the people who come to them and buy their services are in the business of selling other stuff not training. Uh, it's a little bit like I was first exposed to this years ago. My very first online 
um, product was a training course for co- uh, coaches, sales coaches, business coaches, some life and health coaches. And why I found a need for this was I had talked to so many of these people who had wonderful soft skills, which really should be called superpowers. Yes. Because that's how the magic gets done with clients. Um, but who had some very confused ideas about business that they got from their coach training, where the people leading the coach training were W-2 employees of the company and not on the hook for generating results out in the wild. And so they were teaching the best of 1983. Yes. You know, <laughs> print business cards, join BNI and go out and offer free discovery sessions. And by the way, none of those things are inherently wrong. Right. There's a, I love my business cards and yeah. <laughs> BNI and other networking groups can be useful environments. And um, discovery sessions in theory uh, can be a useful way for a potential client to experience the value of coaching if it's done right. But there was something so out of touch yes. with life in the trenches because the trainers themselves hadn't sold coaching for 20 years. Right. Sales training seems somewhat like it could potentially fall into that pitfall. And I know many very, you know, um, noble and skilled trainers. Right. Um, I often want to ask people, is selling sales training different in some way from the sales that others are going to need to do with that training. Right. I nope. believe so. I do. And and the reason I say that is because the way that my client who sells pest control is going to sell very different <laughs> than my client who, you know, is a health provider. And so therefore it is important to know how you what types of tools each person needs. Because once again, if I'm going to go build a house, I'm going to need very different tools than the surgeon who's going in to do an operation. So being clear on what types of tools to provide for them is important. There are some universal things, obviously, but there's also some things that we as sales trainers need to be willing to invest. And so therefore, I don't take every single client and I don't have a huge array of clients. I know how many people I could work with at one time because there's a huge investment in figuring out what your business needs, um, how you're going to be approaching your clients and how are you going to determine who your own avatars are. So that's one of the first things is helping them to determine who their ideal client is so that we can speak in that language. I can talk all day, but if I'm speaking a language that a person's not able to understand, they're never going to hear me. So it is important for me to learn the language that the clients, that my clients are trying to reach speak so we can help them with that. So I do agree sales training is different than, you know, sales in and of itself, but there are ways to ensure that we're able to help our clients and meet their needs. Tish Times CEO of Tish Times Networking and Sales Training. I look forward to hearing more from you as we engage further in this conversation. You've touched on so many rich topics that I think are worth delving into. But I want to turn for a few minutes to Lisa Riley, owner of Link Business, a business broker intermediary firm. And Lisa, you also serve with the International Business Brokers Association and chairing the Market Pulse team. Uh, we've had you on the show before to talk about Link Business, and you're welcome to give us an update about that. But I'm especially curious to hear uh, what's going on with Market Pulse. This gives you a unique window into the world of small business, uh, which Tish was just speaking about. Uh, so first of all, what is the Market Pulse uh, research about and how does it work? And what have you learned uh, that you're going to talk about today? Hey, the International Business Brokers Association m a Source and Pepperdine University private capitals market have been creating a quarterly survey of, from business intermediaries since Q2 of 2012. So we have a quite a depth of information. Every quarter, we ask them basics and some and one or two, shall we say, hot topics that go on. We have just got the basics back from our Q2 report, which was sent out uh, July 1 through July 19th. Typically, people only have 15 days to get it back. This time, July 4th came on that odd Thursday. Right. So so we decided to be nice and let people have a little bit more time. But, But this survey is really supposed to get the pulse of what's going on in this lower middle market. And the Main Street, because there's nothing out there that really focuses on them. And this is important because this is such a such a 
a linchpin of the entire economy in some way. It's the the bottom of the pyramid where the largest numbers of people that any individual business owner may be doing, you know, small tickets and, and things of that nature. But th- you add them all together and it is a huge part of the business landscape. So the the lens that you have into what's happening with Main Street and SMBs is vital in some way, um, not just as a canary in the coal mine, but also as as an indicator of the health of the economy when things are good. What are some of the things that you're seeing? Well, this year, this quarter, um, in 2019, compared to last year, we have found definite trends between the Main Street and uh, lower m and is, And those definitions are businesses that sell for less than a million dollars are typically considered Main Street. Businesses that sell for $2 million or more, $2 million to about $50 million, are called lower M&A. And that $1 to $2 million, it just depends. It could go either way. Um, so what we have found that this year compared to last year, Main Street more businesses have actually sold this year as compared to last year. On the other hand, for M&A, fewer businesses have sold this quarter as compared to last quarter. Last quarter, yeah. not year over year, yeah. but Q1. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Q2. interesting. Q2. 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 Okay, because you're looking at the numbers for Q2, even yes. though they're preliminary. Yes. The Q1 report was out, was out. months ago. Yes. Now, what do you make of all this? And and part of the reason why I wanted to have you back to discuss this was an article that was just published in Phoenix Business Journal um, two days ago, saying the headline is, small business acquisitions are down, tariffs and trade war could be to blame. And if you just read the headline, you might think, oh my, you know, wow. But I think there's a little bit more complexity and therefore more nuance to this story. So, Phoenix Business Journal reports that in the three months that ended June 30, fewer Valley businesses were sold. And they were also sold at a lower median price than during the same period in 2018. So that's year over year. Now, the source for this is uh, bizbysell.com, a San Francisco-based website that tracks small businesses for sale in the past decade. What's your initial reaction to help us put this in context, to put this in perspective? What are we, what are we really looking at here? Biz by Sell is the behemoth, the, the biggest um, website out there for business owners and brokers who want to sell Main Street businesses. They're really focused on Main Street. You'll see a lot of restaurants and um, businesses that are selling for less than a million dollars. Uh, that's their focus. So when, when you see that the median sale price is $200,000, that automatically tells you something about the types of businesses that are being tracked in this data set. Correct. And it also is, like any data set, there are pluses and minuses. Um, this data set is self-reported. Peer comps, another data set, is reported by SBA lenders. Right. So, so um, we all know what happens when people input things. There are mistakes. Um, lenders, it's actually data. It's the best we've got out there. It's, uh, it's really good information. It gives us something to start with. But you just have to understand what you're reading. For sure. And th- this is why I think it's important to contextualize some of this with, with a little bit more thought than, than necessarily fits into a single article. The headline alone makes it sound like things are bleak. And, you know, tariffs and trade war, i.e. politics and policies, are to blame. Um, Is that what you're seeing? Or could you even begin to make that uh, claim based on the data in the market pulse? Um, Different claims, but different data sets. Um, In fact, even personally, our office Q2, we had a fantastic purchase price, was higher than last year. We had five businesses close. We had a really good quarter, okay? Uh, Additionally, in the survey that we just asked, we asked how many had sellers or potential sellers been affected by trade tariff issues? I mean, we flat out asked the brokers and the intermediaries. Sure, it's on everybody's mind. Yeah, and so what we found was that 
the brokers who had been dealing with the sellers or the intermediaries know zero potential sellers or sellers were actually feeling that impact. And at the Main Street, that was 78%, where at the lower M&A, obviously, it's just about two-thirds. So the impact is felt more there, which makes sense. Help me understand what you just said. They feel there was no impact of trades and tariffs? Correct. And the total number of people who felt there was no impact was 78%. Correct. Got it. So it really is an overwhelming majority of people felt that the impact was effectively zero. Zero. Mm -hmm. And yet the rhetoric uh, and uncertainty that's being reported and perhaps created uh, in the media conversations about this stuff, um, it, it seems disproportionately to feature in the headlines, as in this particular case. Not because the reporting is bad, but because I think reporters are trying to find the story. The niche. And it's difficult when you've got, as you do here in the studio, a pile of data with charts and graphs and things in front of you and a, and a social scientist's training to try to make sense of what's going on. So somewhere between the rhetoric and the reality is the story, yeah. right? And when we asked people for a little bit more information, some people felt the tariffs were positive for their business. And of course, it depended on what type of business you had, because obviously, like anything, some things that are negative for some are positive for others. One of the things that you said a minute ago, Lisa, and I think this is critical and it's worth underlining, your interpretation, one's interpretation of the data is going to depend to an enormous degree on the nature of the data itself. And this is an industry that is relatively fragmented insofar as there are business brokers, intermediaries who are working with both buyers and sellers in so many different markets. Um, They're seeing a unique view of it. I'm imagining kind of a disco ball here. There's little mirrors all around the thing, (laughs) kind of reflecting some separate piece of what may or may not be a a coherent whole, Mm right? Right. Um, not to get too philosophical here, but how much of of this is dependent on your own unique position with Link Business and your role with the International Business Brokers Association? Is there a way to, to kind of make sense of all of it or is it just too scattered because there's proprietary data, biz buy sell has one take, you've got another, how do we make sense of it? Well, first and foremost, please note that business sales are not public knowledge. Right, exactly. So They're there private is transactions. No database, unless you're a publicly traded company, which anything at the lower middle market tends not to be, although they could be acquired by a public company, and then those that information is made public. But nobody ever has to report anything to anyone. Very important point. So we're already we're looking at self reporting all the way down. Mm-hmm. There could be meaningful sales, transactions, purchases, or sales. They're simply not showing up in any of these data sets. Correct. Uh Uh-huh. Keep going. What else do we need to understand here? And that there are differences by type and size of business, obviously. I keep talking about Main Street versus lower M&A versus the M&A deals. Main Street are those where um, you have an owner-operator. The owner is involved. They are... 99% 99% of the businesses. <laughs> it's it's somebody who has. They can have up to 10 or 20 employees. That doesn't matter. It's just that they're involved somehow. Um, I loved what Tish was saying about processes because without the processes and systems, the business is not saleable. <laughs> and, and businesses, um, as we talk about sales, The numbers you'll hear is less than one out of three businesses out there that we know that are for sale actually sell. Right. Let alone for the price the business owner wanted. wanted. This goes right into the heart of the work that you and your team at Link Business are doing every single day. You're working with business owners and who who might want to sell as well as buyers Mm -hmm. to help them prepare for the sale. I remember from our last conversation here a few months ago, we'll link to below this episode, that this is the number one thing you wanted people to understand about preparing your business for sale. It's a process that starts, what, three to five years before? You're even thinking about selling. Mm -hmm. What do they need to be doing? Well, 
those financials. Um, they better be reporting everything as accurately as possible. Getting those uh, perks out of there. The family trip to Disneyland does not have to be a business expense. Um, and, you know, the grocery bill doesn't have to be a business expense because it increases the value of your business. Working yourself out of a job. I love, love to hear my clients say, I went on a week's vacation. It makes your business more saleable. The business ran just fine without you. Getting a management team in place. Um, Not having one key employee, though, or one key customer who might hold you hostage. (laughs) Right. Right. You know, I mean, I hesitate to have Mike McCallowitz be our silent third guest in this show, but the most recent book, Clockwork, is ex- exactly about, which I haven't read yet, I just cracked okay. into a little bit, is exactly about building those kind of operational processes into mm-hmm. the thing. So we need everybody around this table, including the empty seat uh, over here for Mike. We need businesses to be developing and perfecting their sales process, increasing their revenues and their profits. Yes. Not always the same thing. Very we need them to things. be right. <laughs> we need them to be cleaning up their books. Mm-hmm. Uh, no receipts in a shoebox. Uh, uh, yes, you know, and and <laughs> how they've done, how they filed their taxes in the past, and what they need to begin doing to document uh, their financials for a potential sale in the future. They need to draw a line in the sand and really begin to bring some excellence to the financial side of the thing. And, of course, they need those systems that are going to help the business be transferable. If, yes. if as is often the case in, in small businesses, if the owner-operator is the only one who's holding the thing together, you, there's no business to be sold. Or if there is, it's definitely not at the value wanted. So we really work on aligning those seller expectations. Um, it's really hard because... People work for years. They put their blood, sweat, tears, miss vacations, miss family times, sometimes divorces. They work and they focus on the business, but they have not always grown it to the asset that they need it to be when they retire. Just a few minutes ago, Tish Times was telling us how her organization provides done for you services to business owners in developing and even executing on their sales process. Link Business, part of the international Link family, uh, started in New Zealand in 1996. Uh, Anywhere you go, you will also be getting uh, an entire suite of services that can help business owners prepare for the sale. Everything from IT to um, valuation tools that I know you work with them on to ensure accurate pricing, marketing, and all the materials that need to happen to get the business sold. Mm -hmm. Lisa, what are you seeing as you engage every week with business owners here in the Valley? I know like Tish, your, your work takes you to many different places. What are you seeing specifically here in the Valley? What's the business landscape? What's the pulse of our local market? Is it possible to characterize that in some way? I can characterize what we're seeing and getting as our phone is ringing a lot more. We are talking to a lot of people, sellers, who are looking to exit as well as a lot of buyers. Um, Like Tish, uh, we don't take the majority because we have that hard conversation. We provide a complimentary valuation saying, okay, this is what most likely a buyer will pay for your business. And then we work on that that um, relationship because it takes six months to a year to sell a business. And if we're not getting that good vibe up at the beginning, we just can't waste that time and energy um, on somebody who's got unrealistic expectations, won't provide those good books and records, won't work with his team or her team, and that includes their accountant letting them know so they're not trying to minimize their taxes, Um, their financial advisors, so they can't come in and say, I can't sell that at $2 million. I'm only going to keep $500,000 because of the way they've run it and had it, so they don't have enough to live on. So we like having the whole team there with us um, moving it through. But yeah, those relationships are critical. And nine times out of 10, uh, 
the business isn't saleable either due to the financials or the seller's expectations. Lisa Riley, I am curious about something, which is in your preparation for this role, uh, in addition to the academic background, your PhD from University of Notre Dame, which, that was sociology, right? Yes. And, mm-hmm. and I remember we had a fun conversation about the anthropologists and the, <laughs> the sociologists, sociologists, right? And now um, we're all merging together at the university it, well, level. It's one, those, <laughs> it's one of those goofy things that in an undergraduate textbook, it seems like it's very black and white. And of course, it's totally not. <laughs> The interesting sociologists and the interesting anthropologists will always hang out together at the bar while everybody else is off doing whatever they're doing. Uh, But in preparation for this role, you sought after and earned two prestigious designations, the Certified Business Intermediary and the Certified Business Broker. In that training and in, you know, the, the rigor of the preparation for those exams and so on, you must have focused a lot on some of the hard skills, the analytical skills, the valuations, the, the a variety of other things that exceed my limited ability to understand them. I'm curious how much of that is active in your everyday role and how much of it is, in fact, the human stuff, the people skills, the things that we were talking about with Tish a few minutes ago. What's the balance between the, the hard economics and the human relationships in your own business? Um, I'm kind of lucky. Um I can read and do the hard analytics, and I like people. (laughs) You got the combination. Good. (laughs) But but it's still hard sometimes to tell somebody their baby is ugly. Yes. So you have to go in. I tried never to do that. I've (laughs) I've learned. That one I didn't have to learn the hard way. I just sort of intuitively knew that would not go well. But yes, their business baby baby is not as beautiful and clever and everything as they think. Yeah. And it's it's not going to get them what they want. In fact, we do the complementary analysis and we will give them a range of the types of buyers and the likely amounts that they will, will pay. We have a maximum range. We don't go in and say, what do you want to sell your business for? And list it at that. We will do our due diligence up front. We work with businesses that are saleable at the right prices. With that said, um, yes, we've never gone in and said your baby's ugly, but but we do have to say, you know, it's a hard reality here. You are the business. Do you have another two to three years to work yourself out of a job? If if you really need this this price here and keep this amount in your pocket, which is actually more important than the purchase price, how much are you going to keep in your pocket after everything's done? Sometimes that does necessitate a lower purchase price, you got to be able to understand and get that point across because people don't understand that either. Um, But tax consequences, depending on where they are, it may behoove somebody to take a lower purchase price. I want to return to the question of what's going on specifically here in our backyard. Your phone is ringing off the hook. Mm -hmm. Um, That doesn't mean necessarily that the health of those businesses is good. It means there's a lot of... um, People seeking to get out. Yes. And this is where, again, we can't, none of us have a crystal ball. If we did, we wouldn't be sitting here. We'd just be day trading. Are people trying to call the top of their valuation market in a way and and scrambling to get out now because they're worried about what's coming? Is there any actual empirical evidence to support that they're right or are we seeing market psychology and, and, and all of the pitfalls that come with that at play here? What's your sense? Well, as Phoenix uh, real estate residential goes, the business community tends to lag behind a year or two. So I just heard on the radio coming over here <laughs> that it is a seller's market and we have a very low, low inventory. Of course, we have all that construction going on, so that could flip on a dime. Um, But the problem is, is the unknown. Next year, our crystal ball and past history has said during election years, the uncertainty will mitigate many sales. Buyers don't want to buy. Sellers don't want to sell because of the unknown. Just like national policy gets put on hold and we figure out, well, what's going to come next. And unfortunately, the way we do these election cycles it tends to get put on hold for quite a significant length of time. Um, it, in, 
interest rates going up and down, people will play the odds. They went away. And to be honest, those interest rates are not shifting that much. <laughs> not, not significantly. Not if you take a, a, a broad enough view, view and draw a long yeah. enough trend line. Tish, I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on this same question. You interact with lots of business owners and business leaders throughout the Valley. What's the state of affairs out there Uh, in the real world? What are you seeing? Well, I think this time of year, not only this year, but this time of year, people are looking at their numbers and going, well, shoot, this is not what I projected and I'm not anywhere near it. I need to hire a sales coach. I need to have someone help me to catch up or to figure out how I can maximize the last part of this year. So I'm seeing people, and again, it's not unique to this year for me, for my business. This time of year, we tend to have higher sales because, in our business because people are really getting nervous because they're not where they expected to be, um, probably because they didn't have a lot of the systems and the things in place early on, and they're trying to figure out how can they hit their sales goals? How can they secure more in business and, and, and really dig themselves out of whatever hole they've gotten themselves into? So let's take the case that there are some really savvy business owners listening to this program who are thinking to themselves, you know what, I, I like th- where these ladies' heads are at. I like the services they're describing. I think I might want to sell my business in 2023 because that won't be an election year, not even a midterm, <laughs> right? Well, I guess actually, no, it is. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> 2024. <laughs> uh, and they think what I need to do is get my sales process in order. And then I need to also start a conversation with a business intermediary like Lisa from Link Business. Uh, Where do they start, Tish? What's the first thing you would have someone look? Obviously, they pick up the phone or email and, you know, and reach out to you. But when they do that, what's the first thing you're going to have them look at? Is there a tip that you can give them now that will get them started down the path to success with their sales process? Interestingly, similar to how Lisa said, sometimes people just automatically think, well, I need to hire someone to help me sell. We have to look at, is what you're selling sellable? Is it, is it a good product? Is it a good service? Is it something that people actually need? Are you solving the problems that you think your clients actually have? So we're going to look first to see if we should be helping them or if we should be helping them find someone to determine a good platform for their service or product. This is such a, a wonderful synchronicity because I have the, the Market Pulse report that Lisa and her team put out for Q1, the one that's currently published. And it says right here, 70% of businesses are considered non-saleable. And I can't help but wonder whether or not 70% of products and services are actually non-sellable. Right. Are we trying to sell the unsellable to the unsellable? You know, I had a conversation recently. I won't even tell you how, how recent it was because I don't want the person to go, that was me. But I had a conversation recently. And Within the I'm, last quarter. Right. <laughs> I'm listening to someone talking and, and I'm thinking, how am I going to tell them? that they're not even ready for me yet. What they're trying to do, they have way too many products, way too many services. It's confusing. No one is clear on what they actually do. And we have to get that clear before we can even get into your sales process. And so I would definitely agree with what you're saying is that that's probably the first problem way before they even get to where they're talking to Lisa. It's like, let's look at what you are trying to sell as a product or a service before you're looking at how can you possibly even talk about moving to the next level with your business. And to whom you want to sell it? Because as you mentioned, uh, you know, really dialing in that ideal client or ideal customer persona and kind of making sure there's a good product market fit is essential. Uh, you know, the, the myth of the salesperson is that the sales superhero, you know, could sell, you know, ice to the Inuit, right? Yes. That it's just, and that's not necessarily true. First of all, Inuit don't need ice. They've got plenty <laughs> of it, right? Um, and they definitely don't need you showing up to like meddle in their life. Right. Um, so you're going to engage them in that inquiry. Right. Do you have to be a bit of a, a therapist in oh, that process, absolutely. kind of guiding people uh, to some of those hard truths about themselves? Absolutely. You know, we kind of joked earlier that my husband is a pastor because a lot of that is like I have to be very, very well prepared to deliver some what might be difficult news or just to help them to see things differently than they're currently seeing them. And that's a very delicate process because like you said earlier, these people have been giving their blood, sweat and tears to what they believe is perfect. And to come and tell them it's not perfect yet, 
Or what you have may not ever be perfect. We need to maybe look at an entirely different product altogether. That is a hard conversation. But I think that compassion is required. I've seen some coaches, both sales coaches and business coaches alike, who have don't have that compassion and are not concerned with how this is going to affect them in the future. And I've heard people say, you should just go get a job. And that, that may or may not be true, but it's the delivery that makes it all um, the more palatable for that person to figure out, okay, I can do this. I've had people who've been literally changed their entire service line and now are very successful, but it was in the delivery of that message so that they knew that it's possible, just not quite the way they're doing it. I think it's one of the, you know, the truth is the most valuable commodity, but as the old saying goes, nobody's quite sure who said it first, often is attributed to Gloria Steinem, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. <laughs> that's right. So true. And I think that, that that's true. true in business. Uh, we need the truth. We need honest, ethical advisors who are more committed to our success than they are to selling us their own thing. Right. Who will sit down and say, you're not ready for this, but here's what you need to do to get started. Right. One of our core values that I referenced earlier, one of them is the client has to come above the money. And that might mean saying, I can't help you. You're not ready and being willing to turn that money away for the sake of being able to keep that relationship because at some point they might be ready and they'll respect and trust me and come back because of that hard conversation way more than if I would have said yes when I should have said no. Yeah. And likewise, when we, we tell people, you know, this is what a buyer will most likely pay for your business. A year later, they come back, they've had their business listed and it's gone downhill because they haven't been, they've checked out, which is really, really not a good situation. But then they get realistic um, fairly quickly. We're all about education. It's a former educator, obviously. <laughs> this is what you need to do. We may not be a good fit for you. Besides, it is, it is kind of a, a um, shall we say, meet, greet, date. We're going to be together for a good year. <laughs> Absolutely. And that relationship means you're going to be, you know, in a human relationship. Mm -hmm. Things are going to happen in your world, in your family. They're going to happen in their world and in their family. And of course, the business conversation is only one piece of what's connecting the two of you. Lisa, you have consistently pointed out in our conversations, and it's also pulled out and highlighted in the Market Pulse survey reports, that Main Street isn't planning at least not to the level that they need to if they ever really want to sell. And that there's a desperate need for education. Most business owners only know about 50% of the actual ways they could exit their business. What they're thinking they need to do and how they might sell is only part of the story. How do you educate them and what are some of the key things that you want business owners to know or to think about that they're not currently aware of? Well, there are... Three ways to exit your business. Basically closing your doors, selling it, or giving it away. And by selling it and giving it away, there are multitudes of ways within there. From ESOPs, um, employee stock option a purchase arrangement. From um, putting up a trust for your, your kids or grandkids. There are ways to defer your taxes to make it worthwhile. We talked with one gentleman, and this is a bad problem to have, but he had an offer from a Chinese firm for $150 million cash. He could not sell his business for cash. Tax implications were too great. They would not do terms. He could not do cash. So having, having a quote-unquote ideal offer, it might fall apart when you look at the, the fine terms. print, the terms. Yeah. And the terms are also more uh, more important than the purchase price. In fact, that's what I tell everybody. It doesn't matter what that price is. It's how it's allocated, meaning what goes where. And it's most important what you keep in your pocket. <laughs> right. <laughs> are there trends in the way that those terms are being worked out? Is there something that's emerging or hot or on the decline? SBA lending is there, but not everybody qualifies for SBA lending. We all think we do, but first and foremost, to get money, you got to have money. And this is on the buyer side? On the buyer side. 
um, or if you're trying to get a loan to build your company. To make the improvements and, and that you would need to do to get the more desirable price. All comes back to tax returns. You've got to show that you're making a profit to get money for that side. And as a buyer, you've got to have at least 10% liquid plus working capital, plus the ability to run the business, plus cover your cost of living expenses. So there's a lot that goes into it. SBA is giving them money away. We, we get it all the time, but not to everyone. Sellers still may have to carry, especially if they have less than ideal books. They get to be the bank, which is never an ideal situation, but can be a very good situation for those tax consequences, like I just mentioned about our gentleman. And it can be an also very good way if the books and records are less than accurate. And what does that mean for people who are trying to prepare? If they weren't planning before, as the seller's market heats up, what do they need to be doing now that's even exceeding what they might have had to do a couple of years ago? Let's just say that everybody keeps talking about the tsunami of businesses that are going to be for sale here soon, trillion dollars in business assets that are going to be need to sold or given to the next generation. Most of those businesses may not be saleable. So the transfer may not be the way that people are planning. But in the seller's market, you want to hit it soon. You want to be right there in the middle target range. And you want to sell most likely to the first person who provides a good offer because it's going it's to be changing. Yeah. Parting words, Lisa, about what business owners need to focus on. What's the one next thing they should be doing to help take this process, their preparation to the next level? Back to the basic. Talk with your accountant. Make sure he or she knows you don't want to just minimize your taxes. This is a fascinating conversation with so many different dimensions. Tish Times Networking and Sales Training specializes in helping business owners sell their products and services. Lisa Riley, owner of Link Business, helps business owners sell the business itself or buy one if they're in the market to acquire new assets and new resources. Uh, this is a, a very invigorating to me as somebody who you know operates in, in somewhat of a little bubble with my own small business, but gets to interact with so many business owners and business leaders throughout the Valley. There's unique perspectives you both are offering them that shine a light on exactly what they need to do to help improve their business and their life. Tish Times, thank you so much for being here today. Where do people learn more, connect with you, and, and participate in some of the things you've got going on? All of my information is at tishtimes.com. And on social media, if you look up Tish Times, you'll find me there. Marvelous. Thank you for joining us thank in the you. studio today. Lisa Riley with Link Business. Where do people find you and your company and your services? And get the updated Market Pulse report when it comes out. Well, linkbusiness.com is our national site. And then AZ Businesses for Sale is our local site where you can always get that Market Pulse report. Marvelous. Thank you for joining us today. For all of us here at Business Radio X, this is Dr. Adrian McIntyre, and we'll see you next time on Valley Business Radio. 